Okay. okay, good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me? Yes, hello. It's so lovely to see such a full room. It's quite overwhelming. Um, welcome, everyone, to Young Entomologist Day 2024. Um, I'm your host today. I'm Beulah. I'm the president of the Amateur Entomologist Society. Um, so I'm very excited to be introducing this day and all of our wonderful lineup of speakers. Um, a few housekeeping things first. We have a fire exit here. Should the fire exit, uh, the fire alarm go off? Um, I think follow me. I think I know what I'm doing and where I'm going, but it's likely going to be a member of the public that will have set it off. It won't likely be real, but it's unlikely to happen. Toilets, um, if you don't already know, are back through the cocoon and to the left up the steps and then around near the Darwin Centre 2 cafe. Um, and then something I need to say about safeguarding, please don't leave your children unattended, otherwise we will pin them and put them in the collection. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that's recorded as well, so. <laughs> so, um, as the president of the AAS, it is my duty to um, introduce the society today. I'm not going to speak for very long because we want to hear from you, the actual speakers. Um, so I'm just going to say a little bit about me and my colleagues who are running today's show. Um, so I'm Bula. I'm an entomologist here. I'm a, a beetle botherer um, and also a curator of orthoptroid insects. So that's many, many insects that include the um, the crickets and grasshoppers and mantises, etc. Um, so we have a daffid, we don't have a pointer, but this is daffid, uh, policing very ably uh, a Young Entomologist Day event uh, a few years ago. Um, he's our secretary. I don't believe he's here today, or he might be later, but anyway, he, he makes the society function. And then we have Sophia, Sophia, would you like to just wave to everybody? Sophia has done the majority of the work today and we're very grateful to her uh, for putting on this event. And so Sophia is an amateur entomologist. She's on the committee for our society um, and she's also about to join the NHM as a student here. So that's really exciting. So please do speak to Sophia throughout the day. Hers is an inspirational story. Um, and then last but not least, we have Dr. Victoria Burton here, we could give a wave, Victoria, um, who has been running um, Young Entomologist Days um, for many, many, many years. Um, and so the, we're really, really grateful to Victoria for all that she does for the society. And she also works here at the NHM. So please do have a chat with her. She loves everything that doesn't have a backbone and that includes worms. Um, so yes, we're all entomologists, so please do take the opportunity to chat to us if you want to learn more. Um, if you're tweeting today, here's the hashtag. So just to remind you of the schedule for today, um, it's a busy one. Hopefully we can keep to time. I realise I'm already not keeping to time, so that's a great start. Um, I have one question for you, which I hope the younger members of the audience know the answer to. And if you don't, then it's very important that you do. So can anyone tell me what is the first rule of entomological fieldwork? Oh, there's a hand right there. Say that again, sorry. Stay quiet. That I'm going to add that to my list because probably I'm a little too noisy when I'm in the field. Um, that's not quite the answer I was looking for. Anyone else? We should probably get a list together, actually. The first rule is don't get separated from your lunch. OK, <laughs> very, very important. It's happened to me and it was a disaster. So um, with that, the lunch break, you can if you've brought packed lunches, you can have them out in the foyer there or please go and enjoy our very expensive cafe. Um, and then the other thing about today is the um, the behind the scenes tours, I'll be giving those tours. Um, please don't worry if you can't sign up because we will make sure that you do get to see behind the scenes because we've got some very special insects to show you this afternoon, which I'm really excited about. Right, so 
also just want to give a, a shout out to our partners here today who are making this day really, really special and a little bit different for us. Um, please go and engage if you haven't already with Bumblebee Conservation. We'll be hearing from them later. Um, and also the Young Wilders, who um, are just an excellent youth organisation. And um, if you don't already know about them, please check them out online. So, um, I'm going to get a little bit um, evangelical now. Um, our society functions because of you young people. It also functions because of all of our shared passion for entomology, hopefully. And today is such a special event with lots of really interesting talks planned. So I would really encourage our speakers to have a think about writing up their talks for us and including them, uh, submitting them to our Bug Club magazine. So that would be really, really great to actually follow on and, and read up about what we've been doing today. So, um, This is going to sound very cheesy, but young people are the future of entomology. Um, you know, you're here because you're passionate about insects and we're here to support your journey through that, let's say. We hope that you continue on your journey as young people that are fascinated by the little things that run the world, because as we know, um, insects are ever more endangered and we have to speak out for them and we have to. Well, we have to know what they are before we can speak out and up for them. So the Amateur Entomologist Society is here to help you learn as much as you can about insects and to spread the word as well. So with that, I want to give you a little example of um, a former member of the Amateur Entomologist Society. Oh, no, he's a member of the Amateur Entomologist Society, but a member of the Young um, entomologists and the bug club, etc. So this is my friend, Dr. Joe Parker, and you can see him here, the arrow in the really fantastic 90s fashion. Um, I'm sure he'll be really not happy for me to share this photo with the rest of the world. Um, but he's now a professor at Calicad Academy and he works on um, rove beetles. So I just want to show you a tiny little video of him speaking about his entomological journey and his research. Hopefully this will work. We're going to get a YouTube adverts, but hopefully not. <laughs> I've been obsessed with insects, like, you know, fanatically since I was seven years old. I used to keep scorpions, tarantulas, giant African land snails, hissing cockroaches, Katie dids. My name is Joe Parker. I'm an assistant professor at Caltech and I'm an entomologist, so I study insects. And the question that really interests me is how do different species of organism evolve the capacity to interact with each other? The group of organisms that I study are really the, kind of the world champions for evolving uh, symbiotic associations. And these are the rove beetles. So they don't look like much because they're very small, but under the microscope, they're absolutely the most beautiful thing. And repeatedly during their evolution, they've evolved to become symbiotic inside the colonies of ants and termites. Probably the evolution of this unprotected, flexible abdomen is that it probably selected for the evolution of a defensive gland, okay? So, you know, you're not physically protecting your abdomen anymore, you're chemically protecting it. You evolve a gland at the tip, and so if something like an ant wanders up to you, you can loop the flexible abdomen over and, you know, hit the ant in the face with your chemical weapon. What this meant was these beetles had this kind of innovative body plan, and they were also this kind of chemical factory. And so some species that became symbiotic Rather than producing nasty compounds from these glands, they produce compounds that can behaviorally manipulate the ants. So ants will approach these beetles aggressively, they'll loop their abdomen over and produce something that ants appear to find very attractive. But there are species that bite onto the ant's antenna with their mouth parts, and they use that to anchor their body on top of the ant's head. And then they use their legs to groom the ant and transfer the cuticular pheromones onto their own bodies. There's some species that are also fed mouth to mouth by the ants, and they seem to graze also on the surfaces of the ants. This is something we're really interested in. And, and if you keep the beetles away from the ants for, you know, 10, 12 hours, they're dead. So they're absolutely dependent on the ants. What predisposes creatures to become symbiotic? And then what happens 
you know, genomically, genetically, developmentally, yeah, neurobiologically, as they move towards a fully symbiotic existence. You're not just studying quirks of the animal kingdom, you're asking a fundamental question about how organisms recognise members of their own species. How do we recognise ourselves as a unitary species as distinct from the rest of nature? And these beetles have like this amazing capacity to kind of break through that and start interacting with the members of another species. An entomologist can come to Caltech with an interesting system like this, and then you're suddenly surrounded by people with expertise and tools. Really amazing directions by coming to a place like this. to that that's little joe parker from the welsh valleys uh a, a little how do i sorry about that let's go Entomologist, very accomplished scientist, does not know how to work a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, so this is an inspirational story um, and it just goes to show you what you can what you can become if you study hard and, and you, you live within the community that supports you, which is the Amateur Entomological Society. So with that, I want to say thank you to our committee, um, some members here today, uh, in particular, Dr. Mike Noble, who is out today. Mike, would you like to just say, have a wave? Please go and have a, a chat with him also. He's a very accomplished entomologist. Um, uh, yeah, so the function of the society is because of the people that give up their free time um, to make it happen. And um, typically, I will end on an inspirational uh, note. Uh, um, this is a conversation between famous interview between Barack Obama and Sir David Attenborough. Um, and you can read that for yourself. So, you know, just to reiterate, it's so important that you're all here today. We're really grateful that there are so many young people in the audience. And we're really excited to hear your uh, entomological journeys. Um, and so with that, I... Hope you have a great day. I'm going to hand over to Sophia now. She's going to be um, running the series of talks and, and will help all of our young speakers um, give their presentations smoothly, unlike me. Um, and so, yeah, with that, Sophia. Oops, I'm sorry. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sophia. You might have spoken to me over email over the past couple of weeks. Um, so right now I'm going to introduce David Lees, who is a senior curator of Microlepidoptera to do a PowerPoint presentation on Tachystola. Um, this will last about 20 to 30 minutes um, and then we're going to have a small 15 minute break um, and then we're going to continue on with the talks after that. So let me just, how do I present this? You can't make full screen down there. On the right? Down a bit left. This? Left, left, left. Uh, yeah, right, right. Okay. <laughs> That's it, yeah. shoot. <laughs> oh, oh, I'll go to the play setting display. And then what? swap presenter. There we go. <laughs> Hello, thanks for introducing me uh, and uh, welcome to the, uh, the day. Um, I hope this maybe is a little bit inspiring for people here. Um, in fact, uh, we have Barbara who discovered this new moth in a, Lond a London park of all places sitting here and uh, she can maybe uh, chat to you afterwards. So. Uh, This is uh, on the left hand side, uh, you probably know the orange tip butterfly, but probably not many of you know that there's an orange tip moth. And this is Tachystola acrosantha in the top left hand. I actually have one here and Barbara trapped uh, one last night. She can show you later, but uh, it's uh, an Australian moth and it it became introduced in, in the UK quite a long time ago in about 19. 08, I think, but it's spread and is now over most of southern Britain. 
And uh, like a lot of um, uh, moths in family ecophorology, uh, you might know the brown house moth or the white shouldered house moth uh, from your, your homes. It, it tends to feed on detritus. So on 17th of July 2021, Barbara, um, who is a very observant uh, naturalist, was examining her moth trap in Wal Walpole Park in Ealing. And she, she saw on her egg boxes a moth that looked like the Australian orange tip, but it, it struck her that the moth had a very narrow resting posture and it didn't seem to be very orange tipped. So that struck a curiosity. Now, uh, what you do if you find something that you might think is, is a bit odd or, or maybe even new. So what you can do is look up your county, in this case, moth recorder. There's probably one for a lot of different insect orders. Uh, or you can post the query onto social media, something like iRecord is very good. And that's exactly what Barbara did. She actually put the moth in, in a, a small pot and sent it to Colin Plant who's the county moth recorder for Hearts and Middlesex. And Colin thought, well, it might be a tachystola, but uh, hang on a moment. He, he, he mounted it and he noticed that the moth had transparent hind wings. Not many moths have transparent hind wings. You probably know the clear wing moths, but they've got transparent forewings as well. So what if your county recorder doesn't know what, what an insect is? So he circulated among uh, experts on the family ecophority and uh, twirler moths generally. Um, like uh, a lot of Galecioidea, the superfamily is called, the moths have got palps that are rather recurved over the head. And uh, one of the people he circulated to was Martin Corley here. Uh, and he actually noticed that it resembled an ecophorid moth from Australia and New Zealand, which had transparent hind wings in the male. And this moth was called Tachystola hemisema. So problem solved. Here's a Tachystola hemisema from Eastern Australia. And here's Barbara's moth, which uh, I um, uh, digitized in high resolution so you can see the actual scales. And yeah, well, not so fast. So as, as a, uh, a, a check, because Tachystola hemisema had not been seen in Brent before, uh, it was sent to a couple of moth, moth uh, gurus at the Natural History Museum, which included me and Mark Sterling. And we had a DNA barcode done. You probably heard of DNA barcoding, but for moths, it just needs a small leg taken from the moth and it goes through the lab and out comes a 658 base pair fragment of CO1, which is the uh, part of the mitochondrial gene. So what you can do then with the, the Barcode of Life website is you can query the sequence. And here is the query. And to our amazement, it, it appeared to be Tachystola hemisema, but it matched this group of barcodes that didn't have a name from Western Australia. So the, we thought, thought it might have come from Eastern Australia if it was Hemisema. You notice that there are some other clusters here which are also um, called Hemisema. So you'd think this one would probably be Hemisema. But uh, we wondered whether it actually might be an undescribed moth. So we did a lot of uh, work on it. Now, as it happened, our collection is often very relevant. We've got a very good historical collection of Australian moths. And these are two of the specimens. And look, there's there's one with the transparent hind wings. That is actually the type specimen of Tachystola hemisema from Sydney. It was collected by this guy, Eric Edward Merrick. Uh, and I'm always amazed how productive taxonomists were in those days, because he described 14,100 species in his career. I mean, that's just unbelievable. I don't think anyone could go near that today, not even a tenth of that. And indeed, he described this one, Tachystola hemisema. So that's a type. It really did look like that. But there's a browner moth down here, which we actually had, which Merrick also collected in Western Australia in a town called Albany. We thought, well, actually, it could be that one. But this one had no name. So 
What we did now, we, it, we've just got some a new techniques um, adopted in the museum, including this very powerful technique, which can enable us to effectively unlock our collections. Because the DNA in these old museum specimens, these ones from 1885 and 1886, are very, is very degraded. It's in tiny fragments though, and it is present. And using a uh, really amazing technology that you have now, uh, you, yeah, special enzymes and so on, you can actually get fragments and you can uh, do it across the whole genome and you can actually uh, put together a DNA barcode. In fact, the whole mitogenome we put together. Now these, the this is a tree that I built and from the DNA barcodes, you can see in blue, the two historical specimens. There's the Sydney one and it is, that's that must be Takistola hemisema. And this is the one that we decided to describe and uh, you can see, amazingly, it is an exact match to two from uh, one from Willesden, which is in, in London, too. And one is the place, one of the places where Barbara actually traps in someone's garden. There's a two, two from Australia, from Western Australia. And there's a couple that come from Walpole Park. So. We decided to describe this as a new species. And there it is, Takistola mulligani. And it's described in 2023, and it's been sitting in our museum for 153 years. And we based the type specimen on the one from Western Australia. We thought it'd be a bit unfair to Australia to describe it from Walpole Park. So uh, you might think, well, that's how do they really know that it's a new species? That's just a bit of chance with some DNA. But there are morphological differences too. Um, Takistola mulligani has got brown the four wings. The females don't have so transparent hind wings, and these are two females. And if you dissect the abdomen and look at the male genitalia, you can see that there's actually a subtle difference in the, the, the leading edge of the valve. It's rather straight in Tachistola hemisema, and it's more rounded in Tachistola mulligani. So we had both morphological evidence it was new and molecular. That must maybe mean that some of those other clusters are also new species. So you might think, well, that is just an amazing thing to find a new species uh, in, in a, a little park in West London. But I'll put it in perspective. In fact, this is the you can fit 32 United Kingdoms into Australia. United Kingdom has 2714 species of Lepidoptera and they're all described. It's very hard to find a new species, very hard in Britain. In Australia, there's about 10,500 Lepidoptera species described, uh, but there's about 25,000 in total. We know that partly from DNA barcodes. It's um, amazingly diverse, especially for ecophorid moths. So if a moth was to get here by chance as what we call an adventive, there's actually more of a chance that you might find a new species in Britain. So both these um, moths came over somehow. Now there was a little uh, strange coincidence. There's Walpole Park and there's a Walpole in Western Australia. And one of these new moths was actually collected in Walpole, Western Australia. Hmm, this seems a bit fishy to me, but it's just an amazing coincidence. And Albany is only just a, a, a short drive um, east of Walpole. Quite different habitats. This is actually some eucalyptus forest that they're preserving on the hill above Albany, and that's uh, uh, Walpole Park. So uh, you might wonder, how did Barbara, um, who's not a, a professional entomologist, come to finally find a new species? Well, this is her career. She actually started, she was born in Ealing, amazingly, and uh, she started uh, collect, She started re recording and breeding moss when she was 10. And her first experience was with the magpie moth, which she bred on the spindle. And she was so inspired by these magpie moths that uh, she joined the uh, Selborne Society and she was introduced to Perivale Wood by Peter Edwards. I don't know whether any of you know him. He's now retired. He used to work at Kew Gardens. And she still keeps in touch with Peter. And she actually did school projects in entomology and visited the Natural History Museum and got to see behind the scenes. And as a job, she worked at uh, Ealing Council uh, and continued moths just as a hobby. But she took early retirement in 2007 and 
Is she regularly trapped at Osterley Park? She tried to get there last night, but uh, it was closed apparently. And she's expanded the trapping to three parks and, and several lot lotments in the private garden I mentioned. So then she discovered this new one. It hadn't been for her sharp eyes, probably no one who would have noticed and just dismissed it as this common uh, ecophorid moth is common now. Amazingly, she's also the only naturalist still, since it was described, to have found any of these moths. She's found over 25, including part of the type series, or uh, well, part of the, the, the ones that are now in, in a, this drawer in the museum. And I can only think of two moths in this millennium that actually have been described as new to science. And both of those two were subsequently found elsewhere in Europe. So this one was already found new science and we immediately, almost immediately, actually took two years, we established that it actually occurs in Western Australia. So fame at last. The uh, BBC picked it up uh, and uh, they came along and one very cold, um, almost snowy um, morning in January. Um, Jacob Evans, Evans interviewed a Barbara in the park and it got on all through the uh, radio news. And uh, um, I think it was even on CNN's uh, top species of the year for 2023. So that leaves maybe some questions. Uh, how how did the moth get here? Now we found, I don't know whether it's, if you were very um, sharp, you probably noticed in the tree that there were two different uh, places where it occurred in the uh, Mulliganai cluster. And that sort of represents two different, what's called haplotypes. The DNA is slightly different. And that means that at least two individuals must have been imported. But you can see where um, it's a minute area of West London is expanded here. Just um, uh, Walpole Park, Ealing and Willesden, actually not far, a private garden near to Wormwood Scrubs. Now, um, but that gives a great chance to establish how quickly this moth is spreading. Um, because as I said, Tachystolac chrysantha has taken uh, uh, for a century to reach its current range. And what does the caterpillar eat? Now we might suspect something like dead eucalyptus leaves. And I just have been rearing here. Um, these, this is the caterpillar and the pupa of the Australian orange tip, which I've been rearing for a comparison. And you can actually see in the pupa the beautiful orange tips. And you see this this moth is just about to come out of its pupa. So that's it. Um, happy to take any questions if there's time. Uh, otherwise, Barbara can uh, um, talk to you afterwards. In the tea break. So there are many street lights around the URE. So there's been a lot of publicity about street lights affecting the behaviour of moths. Yeah, we're going in the back garden, so the back garden is a quiet so, zone. So Allotments are usually pretty quiet because it's in the middle of the allotments. So even in the middle of London, there are. Well, so that's worked well. So yeah. in the park, yeah. again, it's right in the middle of the so park. Even a big urban area, you can still. Well, it doesn't upset the neighbours, use your box that okay. all sorts of time. Yeah, I make sure that yeah. it's still in the background, but it's yeah. not too much yeah. overlooked in there. So you don't have to live in the country to make one of the things go in Barbara is actually also very intrepid. She goes goes out at night in London parks, but she gets permission. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, thank you so much, David. Um, we have a 15 minute break now, so feel free to get a tea or a coffee or a glass of water. And then we're going to have Scarlett from the Bumblebee Conservation Trust do a small talk as well about their new project. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, thank you all for coming back. Um, 
So now we have a talk from Scarlett, who works for the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. Um, and then after that, we're going to segue into our children's talks. So we'll start off with under nines and then 10 to 13s. Um, but yeah, for now, Scarlett is going to take the podium. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Lovely to, to see you all here today. Um, I, yeah, I'm Project Development Officer for Buzzing in the East End. So this is a, an exciting new project that we're bringing to London. Um, I have handed out some surveys to some of you because we're still collecting data, um, but I'm going to be telling you a little bit about that today, um, about some of the bumblebees you can see here in London and how you can get involved and, and help those. So, um, woo. I didn't realise I'd done it it's so fun. That's great. Um, there are over 275 different types of bee in the UK. Um, so we have one honeybee. This is the only bee that makes honey. It's a domestic species, so our beekeepers keep them in hives. Um, and the number of uh, honeybees correlates to the number of beekeepers. So um, they're, they're not in decline, they're not under threat. Um, and in London, uh, we need to be careful about where we put our hives. We've got lots on roofs especially around in central London and we don't have a lot of forage for them so it's something that we're kind of trying to raise awareness of that we have um, lots of other wonderful bees as well um, we have 24 bumblebees here in the UK and um, they're obviously my favorite um, in my unbiased opinion um, and the vast majority are our solitary bees so we have over 250 different solitary bees as their name suggests they nest solitary on their own the female she does everything for her for her, her young in her nest um, she provisions it all whereas our bumblebees and our honeybees have the queens the workers that social structure that we're more more familiar with but yeah we have a huge diversity and i'm just going to show you um, some of the, the species that we find you're most likely to see in London. Um, and when you're getting into Bumblebee ID, um, I've, some of you have brought some books, so you're, you're thinking about um, getting out and surveying. The, the way that you tell them apart is looking at the colours of their stripes and the positioning of them. So you can really get your eye into some of these species um, uh, quite quickly, which is, which is quite nice. Um, so buff-tailed bumblebee is uh, one of our common, common bumblebees that we have out and about. Um, our common carda, very ginger all over. Um, obviously, this is not taken in, in London. This is a, <laughs> a much nicer location. We've got our little early bumblebee. This is our smallest bumblebee in the UK. It's got a little red tip to its tail and it's got the yellow stripes as well. Um, we have the red-tailed bumblebee, much bigger, got uh, all black and just that big right red Ah, oh, bright red tail. Um, so yeah, the good thing with the, the names as well is you can kind of yeah uh, remember them quite nicely. Um, the white-tailed bumblebee uh, with the yellow stripes and the white tail. So these are the kind of um, features that you'd be you'd be looking at. Um, our tree bumblebee has arrived in the UK. It's naturally colonised the UK, um, and we're quite happy about its arrival. So it's not um, out competing our other bumblebees. And this bee, um, unlike a lot of other bees, will will nest um, up in old tree cavities, but they'll even use things like tip boxes. So if you if you have a tip box that's been taken over by bumblebees, it might be this one here with that ginger forex and the the white tip to its tail. Um, and our garden bumblebee. So if, you, if you're lucky to have en enough to have a garden in London, uh, you might see this species. Um, it's, yeah, it's our species with the longest tongue. So its tongue is as long as its body. Um, and when it's flying around, it sometimes doesn't even bother to tuck its tongue all the way back into its mouth because it's so long. So it just flies around sticking its tongue out. So if you see a bee sticking its tongue out, it might be this one here. So we have lots of, um, Bumblebees in, in London, and of course, they're very important as pollinators. Um, so lots of our insects pollinate. I don't want to forget about the other pollinators. So, you know, our bees, our butterflies, our moths, beetles, flies and wasps all pollinate. Um, lots of people ask me, what's the point of wasps? And they can say that they're pollinators and all of our bees have evolved from wasps. So they're, they're very important species. Um, but yeah, we've got the fantastic pollinators, but bees are among our best um, because not only are they visiting flowers to drink the nectar, they're also collecting the pollen to bring back to their young. Um, so because they're collecting the pollen and often our bumblebees are very hairy, they're getting all the pollen stuck on them. So, so they're fantastic pollinators. Um, 
and one in three mouthfuls of our food relies on insect pollination. So it, so many of our fruits, our vegetables, our nuts, our beans, um, we need our insect pollinators for. Uh, there's a little fly, a tiny midge called the chocolate midge that, that pollinates the cacao flowers. So without this fly, we wouldn't have chocolate. Um, without our bumblebees, we wouldn't have tomato ketchup. There's so many things that we, we need these insects for. Um, and yeah, not only for our food in our landscape, those beautiful flowers that we see and we love, uh, the majority of those, about 80% of those rely on insect pollinators. So they're hugely important um, ecologically and economically for, for us. And I've got a little video here of a bumblebee collecting pollen. And as you can see, she's she's scraping the she's trying to scrape it back into her basket. So she collects the pollen onto onto her fly here. We know it's a female because if it's collecting pollen, then it's a female. The males are lazy. They don't go and collect pet pollen for the nest. So if you see that, you already know it's a female um, and the females are the ones that will sting you. So um, this is the ones you'd be, be more careful with. But, um, she's collecting the pollen into her basket here to take back to her nest, um, but she's also getting covered in it on her on her body. So when she flies to the next flower, she can transfer some of that pollen and help that plant set seed. Oh, I don't want to watch it again, even though it's very good. Um, but sadly, our bees are under threat. So one in three of our UK bee species, 32%, um, are threatened and we're seeing declines in their numbers. Um, two of our bumblebees have sadly gone extinct. Um, so this one up here is a short haired bumblebee. Um, it's, it's gone extinct. We, we did have a fantastic project running in Kent um, trying to reintroduce this species because we had introduced it into New Zealand. So we tried to bring it back. <laughs> um, and also we tried to bring some from, from Sweden. Sadly, we haven't sighted it again um, in the UK since we since we did the reintroduction. But that project has been fantastic for all of our rare bumblebees. So that's still running down in Kent. Um, it's a, one of our one of our um, yeah good projects. Um, and this here is a picture from one of our specimens uh, at the Natural History Museum, the Collins bumblebee, um, which has also sadly gone extinct. Um, and seven more are under threat. So we have seven uh, rare and threatened species that are action priority species um, that we're working to protect. We're working to, to, to get their numbers up. Um, and some of them have seen huge declines, um, in some instances, even 90% um, declines. So they really need our help. Why are they disappearing? Um, so Bumblebees need lots of flowers. Um, they're only ever 40 minutes away from starvation. So even when they've gone and they've just fed from flower, they've filled up their honey stomach uh, with nectar. Um, they're only ever 40 minutes away from starvation because their flight is hugely energetically costly. Um, they beat their wings 200 beats per minute, um, so per, per second, sorry, 200 beats per second. So they need a lot of energy to fly. So they're only ever 40 minutes away from starvation. So if they don't, they can't get to a flower in that time, then, then they are sadly going to die. Um, if you do see bumblebees when you're out and they're on the pavement and they've, they've died, this is likely what's happened. They've not managed to navigate to a flower in time. Um, and over the past 80 years, we've lost 97% of our ancient wildflower meadows. So if you were to look at the map of England, um, it would be an area the size of Wales within England that we've lost that that habitat. So it's been a huge reduction. Um, and uh, what we're trying to do is, is, is to plant more flowers to get to get their habitats back. Um, but some of the causes for this habitat loss since the Second World War, we've incentivized farmers to go out to, to, to uh, create lots of food and to intensify our farming so that we can grow more food to support our population when recovering. So we had a lot of schemes in place for farmers to incentivize um, essentially growing monocultures. And even though we see this as green, this is a green desert. So for bumblebees flying through this landscape, this is just um, as flower poor as concrete. So. We want to, um, we've seen a huge intensification of, of farming and we've also seen in our cities increased urbanisation. Um, but yeah, what's quite nice and we're seeing in cities like London, you can, um, you know, create these networks for them to, to travel through. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, we want them to be able to thrive in, in our urban and in our farming landscapes as well and kind of reverse those declines. So 
in London, even though it is a urbanised area, we do actually have um, rare species, threatened species of bumblebee living here. So the brown banded carder bee can be recorded here. It is recorded here on, on quite a few sites around London. The shrill carder, which is one of our rarest, it only has five populations left in the UK and one of them is in London. Um, so that's that's very cool. Um, historically, we have recorded the red shanked carder bee, bumblebee and the ruderal bumblebee. Um, so we're hoping um, to go out and survey and see if these ones will turn up again, if we can find these these bumblebees again. And uh, we're, we're, we're wondering if the moss carder will turn up as well, because we have some unverified records of the moss carder. Um, so we're going to be out looking for these rare bumblebees to understand a bit more about them. Um, because, yeah, we have a few recent records um, and we want to kind of figure out where their distribution is. So that's kind of the background to the project that, that I'm developing, the buzzing in the East End. Um, we will be out surveying for these rare bumblebees. We want to figure out where the populations are, what the habitat's like in those areas, and how we can connect these different populations together. Um, and once we have these kind of hot spots of where to prioritise, we're going to be working with local community groups, um, local landowners to, to, to make those areas better for those rare bumblebees. So in this one year development phase, um, which is generously funded by Consumer Trust, um, we're gathering data and support for this project, and we're going to um, be looking to submit a a bid at the end of this year to extend this project for, for another four to five years. Um, and through this project, there will be opportunities for, for people to come and get training on Bumblebee ID if you want to upskill to come to different events. Um, we'll be offering traineeship, paid traineeships and jobs um, in the area. So if you are interested in entomology and you're looking for opportunities, then um, in London, this can be this could be a fantastic um, opportunity for you. These are the boroughs that we're, we're currently working in. So we've got 11 different boroughs across um, East London and, and South East London that we're working in. Um, and we've, we've chosen these boroughs um, because this is where we have our S41 records. So these are the records of the rare bumblebees. And you can see the little orange squares, there's some dotted around, but we're going to go into these areas, we're going to go into neighbouring areas and, and green habitat and see if we can find, and hopefully some more of these, these rare bumbles will turn up. Um, and I did mention that um, London is is heavily urbanised, but we do actually have a lot of green space here in London. So we want to kind of go into these sites and make them um, better quality for for pollinators and to connect these more. So you know um, we we need these kind of little pollinator pit stops in between so that our bumblebees can can move through the through the landscape. Um, yeah, which would be fantastic to see. So I just thought I'd highlight some upcoming events this month. Uh, we've got a few more events um, if people are interested and, and you are local. Uh, we have a bumblebee safari and seed bomb making day to celebrate Earth Day um, in Crystal Palace Park at the end of this month. We also will be running a birds and bees walk at Thames Mead um, on the 27th of April. So if you're in the local area, you can sign up. Um, yeah, these are free, but you need to book onto the Eventbrite so you can come and see me afterwards. I can give you the links. Um, and you can sign up to our newsletter and we'll be doing uh, events every month throughout the year, um, as well as just sharing project updates about these rare bumblebees, what we're finding and, and our partnership. So if you would like to sign up to our newsletter, please do come and see me afterwards and I can I can get you signed up. So I wanted to go through um, how you could help. Oh, I've made this fun as well. Here we go. Um, so um, what are bumblebees need? They need safe, sheltered places to nest. Um, so leaving some areas of your garden uh, undisturbed where they can they can nest. Um, lots of our bumblebees will use old rodent holes um, and our card bumblebees will kind of make a, a, a nice cozy nest um, out of tusky grasses. So um, if you leave areas undisturbed, um, often you find them turning up in compost um, heaps and under sheds and they can they can they can um, yeah, they can use those areas. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, we've had these huge decline in flowers. So any flowers that you're able to to plant out, whether that's, you know, you're able to kind of convert a lawn or just pop out a window box um, or a flower pot, then you can be making a huge difference for for lots of our pollinators. Um, 
by kind of taking notice, going out, looking at these bumblebees, getting your eye into to identification, um, submitting records uh, to iRecord or part of our bee walk scheme. Um, we have lots of opportunities to, to train in bumblebee ID um, across the country. So if you're not um, from London, then there's lots of opportunities across the country and online to join lots of resources. So um, if you're interested in it, we can definitely kind of help you help you along the way. Um, one of the most uh, important things you can do as well is to spread the word. So, you know, tell people about this amazing diversity of bees that we have um, and get people kind of, yeah, raise awareness of, of what they need as well. Um, and you can donate so you can become a member. You could purchase um, some of the little pins or something that we have at our stool, which goes straight back into our charity, or you can donate your time. Um, so we do have volunteering opportunities if you're looking to get more experience as a young entomologist. Um, we have lots of volunteering opportunities um, around the country. Um, but yeah, I will recommend going to our Be The Change part of our website because it has lots of resources for kind of getting involved and, and getting started. And you can make a pledge on our website to be the change to your, your willingness to kind of take an action for bumblebees, whether it's planting, creating nesting or spreading the word, you can make your pledge. Um, and we kind of, we love to see um, people's pledges and, and the photos they upload and, and what they're doing. So yeah, that's, that's fantastic um, if you can do that. We also, we want to hear from you. So I think I've spoken to some of you already, but we've got, uh, we're collecting data um, for our project for support. And we, we, we want to, we want to, um, we want people to tell us what they what they need in their local areas so and what they think the biggest threats are to to bumblebees so we do have this um short survey and if you are able to come and fill it out afterwards then that would be absolutely fantastic um because we can use that um, to get support with our funders and make sure that it's the the best project that it can be for for the local area um so yeah if you do want to, to get involved, um, you can email me um, and I can give this out to you afterwards, write it down. Um, but any questions, any uh, if you if you spot any bumblebees, you want help with ID, you can email me. Um, if you if you know of any community groups in the area that you think would would want to be involved or any patches of habitat, if you go out and you 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 see some that's, you know, it seems to be a haven for wildlife, then then do let me know. We're we're um, we're, we're looking to kind of, yeah, work work in, in those 11 as they mentioned um but yeah do, do contact me and yeah i just thought i'd give a little bit of time for any questions if anyone has any but um if not then you know you can always come and see me afterwards yeah So, um, so lots of, uh, our, of our insects can migrate quite far distances, so they can cross across the channel. Um, so with climate change, we're seeing uh, species naturally shift their range. Um, and so we consider this not an invasion and natural colonisation, it's natural expansion of its northward range. And it's yeah, it's managed to make it across the ocean um, uh, to us. And it's kind of, yeah, it's travelling through, um, through, through the UK um, and we kind of, because we've been collecting data, um, we can kind of see through our volunteers when they're spotting them and seeing its um, its journey through the UK. So yeah, it's just it's just a natural. It's it's come across and it's doing well and it's not competing any of our other species. So we we welcome it. We <laughs> yeah yeah. I'm I'm interested in why you chose East London for this project. Is it because there are um, the more the rarer bees are there, and if so, why why are the rare bees in East London. Yeah, so yeah, we that was one of the one of the key factors was because we have these populations of, of rare bumblebees um in in East London, um especially along the river, um seem to be quite good habitat remaining for them there. Um I'm not sure like a hundred percent why they're doing you know there are more populations than than versus in, in West London. Um, but we can see that 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 where the records are, it might be due to recording bias. So you know that that might be why we get more records showing up there. But what we really want to do is understand their distribution better. So in this year, we're going to kind of go and see what that habitat is like and why the reasons they're there. So this is very much yeah, gather data, uh, data gathering year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Yes. Best kind. That's a very tricky question. So 
lots of um, uh, different bees will feed from different flowers. Um, so they have different length of tongues and they also have different food preferences. So a lot of our bumblebees will feed from a few different um, few different flowers, which is good. Some of our solitary bees are very fussy eaters. Um, we have a large scabious mining bee here in London, which only takes pollen from field scabious. So without that flower, it wouldn't be able to survive. So there's, it depends what species you want to protect. But for bumblebees, um, we, we often recommend planting herb species. So they can be really fantastic to bring into your garden. Um, things like lavender, uh, mint, you know, th these you can go and um, you can plant. They, they love them. They absolutely love them. But we do have on our Be The Change menu, uh, uh, Be The Change, we have monthly menus. So you can go on um, and you can see different recommendations for, 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 different, um, for different areas. But if you live near a rare bumblebee, maybe you want to look at its its food plants. So there's different things to to uh, consider, but wildflower mixes and um, herbs, I would recommend as, as a starting point. And yeah, we have lots of information on our website if you want to have a look at different plants. Um, yeah, at the moment, um, seeing lots of bumblebees on lavender, which is really nice. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yeah. I just did with bumblebee bottle right? Yes, okay, yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it? Um uh they have so yeah, that's why it's it's shown there because we they have these different colour forms. Um actually a couple of uh different species can show a melanic form. Um I'm not actually 100 percent sure why they 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 display this this melanic form. Um but yeah, there's a couple of, of bumblebees that will do it, our garden bumblebee as well. Um and um yeah it's I, I'm not actually sure why why they why they're expressing this, um, but yeah, it can make idea a bit tricky sometimes. <laughs> but we can yeah, if you see a big black um, bumblebee, then yeah, all black, then it's probably the root. So it's it's a good thing to highlight. Yes. Uh, with the woodland. Topic, yes. You're talking about the tree it's one. Moved. Um, yeah, yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you you're talking about how it's moved progression, but why has it done that now? and not earlier so, it's existed for a long time. Yeah, so I think because we're seeing this change in our climate, so I think because it's getting a bit warmer up here, then they are actually able to kind of move into, into this, this habitat and it suits them a bit better. Um, all of our bumblebees are cold adapted. That's why they're big and they're furry um, and they evolved in the Himalayas. So they're all um, they're all cold adapted. But as we're seeing, we're seeing the, the kind of average temperatures change, we're seeing species um shift their, their range and i think with climate change we'll see a lot more and um, we'll see lots of lots of species on the move hopefully they can keep up with the with the um the changes yeah fantastic yes <laughs> is there any other species of bees that kind of live on the mainland that we're expecting in the next few years to start seeing that will start oh uh i don't know i'll have to um, if I give you my email just afterwards, I can have a little research and, and have a look and see what we're what we might be expecting to come across. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's 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 I think there will definitely be some uh, more species coming across because it's not that not that far across um, for for them to fly. Um, some of our our small pollinators, like the little uh, marmalade hoverfly, for example, can can travel. It does migrations from Africa all the way up to Northern Europe. So these tiny animals can actually travel huge distances. So yeah, um, if I give you my email just afterwards, I can have a look into it for you. Yeah, amazing. Um, is that it, is that my time? <laughs> uh, if there's any more questions, is, is there any more questions? Yes. Um, so is that if we say planted then? Uh, flowers that would see yeah, a rise of these untouched species in uh, the UK. Uh, yes. Yeah, so if, if there's yeah, my journey. Yes. Yeah, so uh oh, so hang on. Sorry, you're asking if we plant specific flowers for uh insects coming across. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, so I think we have a lot of um, uh, Europeans, the same wildflowers um, as Europe as well. So when they do come across, um, it's not that we need to, to go out and plant um, some of those flowers to kind of encourage them. I think um, often they will sort of blow across and we have a lot of similar species for them to, to, to feed on already. So um, I think uh, we would need to plant something specific to encourage them across. I think um, I think they're 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 thermal tolerances and um, will kind of 
prompt them and if there's a good wind on the day they can get across the channel <laughs> yeah yeah yes okay so you're seeing a lot of the asian hornets coming across yeah 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 i think um so for our bumblebees um, our bumblebees aren't as impacted as say the honeybees um they tend to be a bit cleverer and they're um you know they they kind of um they don't come and like hawk the nests in the same way that they do for the honeybees so the Asian hornets, I think, I think it's going to be inevitable that they're going to come across the rate of the nests that are that are coming. Um, I think, um, you know, they they are an invasive species and they can they can have an impact. But I think we need to be careful about when we're putting out traps for them. I know some people we need to make sure that we're not trapping our other pollinators. Um, I think it's inevitable that they're going to be here. Um, the for our for our bumblebees. Um, they don't pose as much of a threat as they do to, to honeybees, um, where they will just sit by the nests and kind of pick up, pick off honeybees one by one. So I know a lot of beekeepers are very concerned about them, but um, I'm I'm not sure what we could do to 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 slow the spread. I know they've been destroying nests, um, but I, I personally think it it I think they're gonna they're gonna get here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Okay, um, any other questions? You can, you can always come and um, speak to me afterwards as well. Uh, <laughs> yes? How far can they travel? How fast? That's a good question. I don't actually know how fast they travel, um, but some of our bumblebees have been recorded to travel up to like over a kilometre to go and uh, forage for food, which is a huge distance in comparison to their body. It's like, you know, it, it'd be going around the world to go almost to the shops. It's absolutely crazy. So some of them can travel really far. Um, but one thing to note as well is some of our solitary bees, for example, can only travel very short distances. So the average is about 250 meters. So it's really not that far when you think if you're walking down the street and you can't see flowers along the route, then actually they can't make it to the next patch. Um, so they need to have a lot of, you know, we need, we do need to have these these stepping stones. So if our bumblebees can fly a little bit further, um, when we're when we're creating these kind of uh, thinking about planting for pollinators, we want to think about actually a lot of our solitary bees need them 250 meters apart. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll have to check on the on the speed for you. I'm not sure how fast. <laughs> I'll check on that for you. Yeah. Um, last question or. I can hand over to, to the next speaker. Fantastic. Well, yeah, um, if you if you were willing to fill out my form afterwards, I'd really, really appreciate it. And if you do have any questions, you can you can come and speak to me afterwards. But thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so now the really exciting bit is that we have a few very young speakers coming to present and we are starting the day from the youngest and then ending with the oldest. So it's going to be in order. Um, the youngest we have is Stanley, if Stanley's in here. Um, Stanley is in the under nine category and is going to present my bug zoo for everyone. So I'm going to get that up. Um, Stanley, if you want to stand here. And maybe say your name so we can hear if everyone can hear you. Oh, hello. Oh, God. <laughs> OK, um, Stanley, if you stand here, so the microphone is a little bit far, but if you speak nice and loud for us so everyone can hear you, is that OK? Yeah. Are you ready? Oh, my God. Start again. Who am I? You're okay. You're a bit nervous. Hello and welcome to my presentation 
My name is Stanley and I am seven years old and I have always known I want to be an entomologist. Yes. <laughs> what am I going to talk about? I am going to talk to you today about the bugs in my bug room, which is actually my bedroom. I, ha I currently have 17 insects living in my bug room without counting my cleanup crew. I am going to share with you a little bit of information about some of them now. Who is this? This is Mrs. Harry. What is she? She is my curly hair tarantula. How old is she? She is currently four years old. What does she eat? She eats other insects. I feed her on crickets and locusts mainly. Where does she come from? I brought her an insect show. However, they are native to South America. Cool fact, she throws hairs when she is scared and threatened. Tweedledum and Tweedledee. What are they? They are Madagascan hissing cockroaches. What do they eat? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> they are omnivores, but I put my feed them on mostly on veg and fruit. Where do they come from? The clue is in the name. They come from Madagascar. I also have death's head cockroaches too, which are pretty cool, because when they're adults, they have a shape of a skull on the back of their heads. Cool fact, the Madagascan hissing cockroaches make a loud hissing noise when they are threatened, so that predators mistake them for large animals like snakes and lizards. Praying mantises. I've had a total of four different species of praying mantises as pets. A giant Asian mantis, a dead leaf mantis, an orchid mantis and a flower mantis. What do they eat? When they are nymphs, I feed them on fruit flies, which they are very good at catching. When they grow, they eat bigger flies like blue and green bottles. Finally, when they grow, when they are fully grown, they can eat things like locusts. Leafy, my dead leaf mantis, is a girl. I know because she recently laid an egg sac, which is called a nuthica. It was very cool to watch her laying the sac at the side of her enclosure. As she has never mated, but she would not have made any more mantises, so I have kept it in my specimen collection. My favourite of my mantises was my giant Asian mantis called Bobby Green. Sadly, he died, but he was my first insect pet, and I raised him from a tiny nymph. It was the start of my whole bug room. Cool fact, mantises are the only insect able to move their head from side to side. Incy Wincy. What is he? He is a regal jumping spider. Currently is a sling, which is shorthand for spiderling. What does he eat? At the moment, because he is small, he eats fruit flies. When he grows, he will eat bigger flies, but he's not going to be massive. But he's not going to be massive. <laughs> Males can grow between six to 18 millimeters and females grow between seven to 22 millimeters. Cool fact, jumping spiders can jump up to six times their body length. Humans can only do about one and a half times. Mr. Harry, what is Mr. Harry? He is a desert hairy scorpion and he eats mainly locusts and crickets. He's a bit fussy and he doesn't like it if they're too alive. So I have, so I have made sure they're a bit dead in the bit. <laughs> Why is he called Mr. Hairy? He is called Mr. Hairy because of a difference between a fat-tailed scorpion, which is one of the most deadly scorpions in the world, and a desert hairy scorpion is that the desert hairy scorpion has fine hairs on the pincers. But basically, that's two reasons. How does he defend himself? He can use his sting located on his tail, which to us would feel like a bee sting. Thankfully, I've not been stunned yet. 
Cool fact, scorpions glow in UV light and give birth to live young. They are, they are the only arachnids that do those things. <laughs> desert gold millipedes. What are they? These are my desert gold millipedes. When I wrote this presentation, I had three of them, but sadly one of them died when a shed went wrong. What do they eat? They like soil and decaying fruits and veg. They also like to dig down in their tank and look very cool when they are spiraled like a fossil. Cool fact, the word millipede comes from the Latin word mill, which means thousands, and ped, which means feet. But they don't actually have thousands of feet. There is currently only one species found with over a thousand feet. There was a female found 10 meters below the sand of a boiling hot desert. It had 1,306 legs. Blue deafening beetles. What do they eat? They are omnivores. They eat absolutely anything. They do not care what it is. It just has to be dead. <laughs> How long do they live? They live for an average eight years. Who do they live with? My blue deafening beetles live with Mr. Harry, my scorpion that I told you about earlier. They get along well. They eat the leftover food which he doesn't finish. Cool fact, they play dead when when they are threatened and they are extremely strong. They can withstand being run over by a car, but I haven't tested this theory. <laughs> they, are named, they are named after the people who played in the Beatles, so if you don't know that, their names are George, Paul, John and Ringo. <laughs> Peanut crude. What are they? I currently have thousands of springtails, which are tiny little creatures who help to keep my enclosures nice and clean by eating all the poo <laughs> of further insects. They also are pretty good at eating any of the leftover food that from over from the other insects. I also have thousands of little isopods. My favourite variety are the orange tropical wood ice, whilst arriving in my millipede tank and 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 are growing very big. They might need their own names and tanks soon. They're getting that big. Why are they important and what do they do? Well like I said they help to keep the enclosures nice and clean. Without them I think my room might start to smell. <laughs> well, okay, it might start to feel worse. <laughs> My favourite British insect. My favourite British insect is a broad-bodied chaser, which is a type of dragonfly. I wrote to Sir David Attenborough when I was six. He replied to my letter to tell me dragonflies were his favourite. Thank you for listening to me talk. I would like to end my presentation with a joke. Why did the spider's trousers keep falling down? What? Because he ate all his flies. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, did Mr. Harry and Mrs. Harry have any sort of connection? <laughs> They're both arachnids. <laughs> Just hairy. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, thank you. Oh, there's a question over there. Uh, yeah? Do the scorpions and death painting beetles need a heat source? Yeah. yeah. What do you do for them? So I use a heat lamp with a thermometer, so it's basically you don't need to switch them on and off. And there's a... and they're timed. But that's what I meant by for monitor. And there's also a for monitor just in case it goes overheated. Who else? Mrs. Harry also has a heat source because she lives in a forest in her tropical climates. Because she lives in parts of Costa Rica as well. So I don't know anything about keeping insects, but I'm just here with my stuff. But tell me then, you said one of the things you have to feed them fruit flies. So where do you get their, like things like that? Do you have to breed them yourself? What? I buy them on eBay. 
all your being sex you then have to read your oh, that's you're starting you might do, so. yeah i'm going to start to try in a couple of weeks so your your bedroom's going to get even fuller and fuller. Yeah. Did they keep you up at night time? Do they make lots of noises or anything? No, that's mostly your young brother, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we say thank you. Is there more questions? Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation. I absolutely loved it. What do you want to be when you grow up? An entomologist. Yes. Oh. <laughs> That was amazing. Um, Stanley set the bar very high, uh, but don't be worried. Uh, we have some amazing speakers. Open up. So now we are in the 10 to 13 category, so a little bit older. Um, I also just wanted to say for all the speakers, so Stanley, Toby, Kumari, find me at lunchtime. We have a few goodie bags for you guys as well. Are you all ready? Do you need anything else? Uh, no. no. Oh, uh, the, that's just a slideshow of some of the uh, uh, pictures I've taken since I was about eight of insects. <laughs> Where was that one then? I never knew. That. So the lady said before this one came from migrated from Africa. You were saying North Africa was that right? Yeah. yeah. North South Africa. Yeah. Um, and it's quite cool because on the way down, they fly a little bit. They'll stop. They'll die. Then they'll hatch out. The next generation do it. So it's in their genes to do that migration, and wow. they do it successive generations. But on the way back, the females can do the journey all in one go. Okay. Um, so that's new research coming out about, about all in one go. That's that's incredible. Yes, it's incredible, isn't it? So yeah. <laughs> yeah, he went to Where was that one? Then? Reading. Reading. You could you could say it too. Uh, okay. uh, those were in Reading on from on a book club trip. Last year. Last year. About the garden? Yeah. Unless you speak through the much better thing. Oh, uh, this was just in our garden. <laughs> but you could you could tell people. That was at Braunton in North Devon. Oh, it's uh, captured a bee and you can see it underneath. This looks like there's an extra pair of wings. Uh, they're both the same species. They're just the brown one is one where the wasp is uh, emerged, and the green one has still got a larvae in. The eyes on their head, I think it's they're trying to pretend to be uh, grass, just snakes or something.
to Reading as well on the same trip. Can you spot the caterpillar? I'm sure this will be back into Reading when you take it out. <laughs> Everybody see it? Did you see it? Yeah. That's a flower, it's not actually an insect. <laughs> <laughs> that was in uh that was at Dawlish in Devon. That was in on a hill in Somerset. And uh, it's a female that's laying eggs. They're also uh, the caterpillars rely on ants to survive. That's outside a library. And uh, there's a hole, I think it's made it, in the top part of a fuchsia flower. And it's stealing the nectar because it doesn't have the right mouth parts to reach into the nectar from the place where other insects would uh, reach it. That was at uh, Oxfordshire last year. It was on a book club trip as well. That was on a book club trip. And this was taken a few days ago in Yorkshire. I found this when I must have been about eight and uh, I thought it would come in with bananas or something. And uh, I think they come from Asia or something like that. Uh, I took that when I was nine. Uh, Uh, that's the end. Got any questions then? Yeah? Do you have a bucket out there? Uh, well, we made one out of a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favourite? Uh, I've got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> like so many, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. What was the hardest to photograph? Uh, probably some of the moths because they kept trying to fly away. <laughs> oh, and I've tried to take a picture of a hummingbird hawk moth and I've Never got one. <laughs> I've got just a blurred photo. Yes? Um, how did you identify all of the specimens? Uh, with a book. Oh, amazing. amazing. Yeah. Right, we did some 
What, what sort of camera do you use? Do you use your phone or have you got uh, a special sort of camera that you use? This one. Oh, oh right. With a cracked nice. lens or with a yeah, cracked screen. A really good close up thing. Yeah. It's just a, it's a Lumix compact. It's, 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 it's quite expensive. Yeah. What's yeah. Really good mm -hmm. camera. So, so you have you've so many insects and for so many years. Are you putting what you find? On uh, are you slipping it in your records because you know where you found them? Uh, no, actually. Well, I hope. We keep I, encouraging, but it's not. not I have got a notebook recently to uh, record yeah, things in. So you keep the field notebook and you do you write down every. Well, I'm going write? to. I've not quite done it yet. But he's got, he's got dates of all of them. So yeah. He can go back. And or I can just use because the dates are all on the camera. Yeah. Of course, yes. they're all stored. Yeah. Well, no, that's the next stage, isn't it? We'll give us a bit. Of... Hopefully, does publish um, <coughs> some information in the book that I've seen. Thanks. Thank you, Toby. Thank you so much. Um, so now we have Kumari coming to speak. Uh, are you okay with switching so you yeah. press aside and then you can go back? Ooh, yeah, sorry, I don't want yeah, to. It's fine. Oh, sorry. If you need anything else, is that okay? Uh, no, I think I should be Okay, so my name's Kamara and some of you may know me from the book club or some of the trips that I've been on and I'm going to do an insect presentation that includes one of my favourite insects, um, insect disguises and also insects I found in the garden and the allotment. So my favourite insect and why? So my favourite insect is a, species, is a new found species of tardigrade called Thygarctus carolansis and here's the classification for it and a photo for you to look at. It was times in around 10 to 15 times because tardigrade are quite small creatures that are normally found in moss or wet areas. Um, so before we go on to who and where found it, who and where it was found, we're going to talk about like facts about tardigrade in general. So um, tardigrade have a common nickname or common name of water bears or moss piglets. One of my favourites, moss piglets. I find it quite cute for the tardigrade. Um, tardigrade can survive for decades without any food or water. They're the first animal to survive in outer space without any gear or like anything to help them. Um, they are resistant to radiation. Um, they can survive pressure as high as 600 megapascals, which is equivalent to 6,000 of us atmosphere at sea level so what we feel when we're on the beach but you don't really feel the difference because we're used to it but it's the 600 times that and the water bears can resist that. Some species of moss piglets can withstand temperatures of up to minus 272 celsius and withstand up to 151 celsius. So who and where found this new species of tardigrade? So in 2021 uh, Mr. Vishnu Datan and Dr. Nadan discovered the first ever marine tardigrade located in India. So they found it at a place called Batakara in Kerala, which they decided to name it Stygarctus carolansis after the place that they found it. So my favourite insect feature like, of all insects. So I'm going to talk about like disguises. So why do insects have disguises? Now, as I'm sure you as now I'm, as I'm sure you're all aware, insects are prey to many animals and other insects such as hedgehogs, birds, rats, frogs, toads, and all other sorts of living things, and sometimes even plants. Because of this, insects have had to adapt and learn to survive without becoming prey to these living things as often as they would be. Now, these disguises can be found in all stages of life, including the egg, pupil larval and adult stages. 
So disguising the egg stage. While I'm speaking, you can have a look at the photos of some examples of the eggs that come from phasmids. So many phasmid eggs, so like stick insects or walking leaf insects, um, resemble seeds and have evolved to have little hooks and spikes on them. Like you would find those little weeds that have hooks on them that you find on your clothes once you walk through a field. So that means that the predators can't find them as often because there's no set place where they can be found because they're always on the move with the animal. And here is some examples of some seeds and some egg cases of some phasmids. So this one is a case. These ones aren't hatched, but the one at the top is. That one next to it at the top has some hooks, like the seeds of the weeds. And these have all been timed in by at least 15 times. So in reality, they are really, really small. Now, disguises in the larval stage. While I'm speaking, try and find the caterpillar in the image on the top. Um, in the larval stage. So in the larval stages, insects are at one of their most vulnerable stages of life, apart from when they're in the pupil stage. Um, many insects, when they're in the larval stage, will make cases or they will cover themselves in plant material, like dust or just corpses of other insects. So here's the caterpillar that was in the other image. The feathers help it blend into the leaf and camouflage it. And this is the green lacewing larva covered in dust and corpses of other insects. So disguises in the pupa stage. At this stage, insects have no way of defending themselves against predators as they transform into an adult. This would mean that they have to rely on their act of disguise in hopes that the, dis that the predator doesn't see them and can just walk on by without noticing them. This doesn't always work, but it does. Many, many um, people will disguise as shriveled leaves or some will disguise as, as small snakes. But one particular species that I like is called the bagworm moth. Their caterpillar will make cocoons out of um, twigs and leaves. So it can't, sometimes they form a little hut shape. So here we have the bagworm moth caterpillar. Uh, you can see the cases are quite disguised. Classic shriveled leaves one. And then this is a cocoon that looks like a snake to ward off birds and predators. So disguising in the adult stage. Now insects in the adult stage will need no need for disguises apart from to live to the end of their natural life and to mate and survive. Now great and commonly known examples of um, disguised insects that have a really good disguise are like walking leaf insects, praying mantises and stick insects. So down here we have a, bus, a buff tip moth at the end, walking leaf insect and a dead leaf butterfly from India. And then here are some more examples. We've got the praying mantis, walking leaf stick insect, and then the walking leaf insect. So insects in the garden and allotment. So an allotment is a big area and it's got these small areas of land that you can rent to like grow vegetables and flowers so we have one and this uh, these are some insects that we found in the allotment and in the little pond that we have so as you can see we found a little lizard uh, under the rocks family of wood lice a couple millipedes this is one spider i was unable to identify it but um, we got some pretty good photos. It was just chilling in the corner of our little summer house that we have, and then just the little pond skater. Now you can find these just by like in the garden if you're gardening, or just like just like uplifting stones that aren't normally turned. But if you do, make sure to put it back so that you keep can, you can keep the home clear and safe. Thank you for listening. <laughs> no, no question. So that was all the speakers that we have before lunchtime. And then at around 2 p.m., we're going to come back and hear a few more. And then we're going to have an afternoon of workshops and activities. So uh, everyone come back here for two. That would be great. Feel free to hang out in the breakout room for lunch. But unfortunately, we're not allowed any food inside here. So um, either in the breakout room or feel free to go explore the museum and the cafes. Thank you to all the speakers. Welcome back, everyone.
Um, I hope you had a lovely lunch and got to explore the museum a little bit and got a nice break. Um, thank you for coming back for the talks for the 14 to 18 year olds. Um, I'd like to introduce, introduce our first speaker. So we have Elena Dragoy, who is coming up to talk to us about the relationship between insects and fungi. How you Hi, I'm Elena, and I'm going to be talking about the relationship between insects and fungi and how th both of these incredible organisms have adapted around each other. The first thing I'll be speaking about is the art of mimicry done by rust fungi. Mimicry is appearing in a different and appealing way in order to lure in prey, in this case, insects. The most impressive case of mimicry carried out by plant parasitic fungi uses visual and scent signals in order to attract insects to fungus-induced pseudoflowers. Flower mimicry is done by several species of rust fungi to attract and utilize insect pollinators to outcross heterothallic strains. Outcrossing, also known as outbreeding, is the transfer of gametes between two different organisms to increase the phenotypic variability within a population. This essentially means that one organism takes DNA coding from the other in order to create more organisms with the desired characteristics. In this case, it was homothallic strains. The fungi in this study, um, the fungi in this study use a host flower to attract pollinators and use them to create an increase of homothallic strains as opposed to heterothallic ones. Heterothallic means that only two organisms with opposite genders can reproduce. The fungi wanted to be able to reproduce more rapidly and efficiently, so they create more homothallic strains in order to do this. These specific fungi modify their host flowers to produce flower mimics that the insects cannot tell apart from normal flowers. This change is not apparent to the insects because they see at a wavelength where it isn't visible. This process is effective because the insects are attracted to the flower mimicry, both by the sweet scent created by the rust fungus and its by, by its bright colours. Second example I will be sharing today is the cordyceps fungus and how this amazing mushroom feasts on living insects, in this case ants. At first, a spore from the fungus lands on the insect and, exo and enters its exoskeleton. It then floods its brain with chemicals, essentially drugging it. The parasite then creates a sort of network throughout the insect, wrapping around its muscles and linking itself to the nervous system. From then on, the insect no longer has control over itself and feels compelled to head to ideal conditions of light, height and humidity, humidity, where it will perform a death bite. This is where the ant latches onto a plant, for example, a vine, and waits until the fungus has completely consumed it, and then the ant dies. Only then can the cordyceps begin to sprout. After about three weeks of growing, the cordyceps can finally begin to um, to share. The cordyceps can finally begin to release its spores and to infect more insects. This cycle repeats, and the fungus is so powerful that it can wipe out entire ant colonies. Here are some more examples of other insects infected, um, such as ants, spiders, and moth larvae. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Oh, thank you, Eleanor. Um, that was fascinating. That was super fast. And these images are amazing as well. I'm introducing Eve. Uh, is Eve here uh, to come up and speak? Uh, let me. Okay. You ready? Uh, how do I use the arrow keys? Sorry? Do I use the arrow keys to? Oh, yes. Yeah. It's just this one. He's okay. falling back. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Eve and I'm 14. It's a pleasure to be speaking as part of the Young Entomologist Day, as I have a passion for moths and entomology, in, in particular moths. Let me start by telling you a little about myself. My interest in nature and entomology seemed to naturally evolve from an early age, and today I'll tell you how this passion came to be. And my particularly exciting find of a rare moth as well as my recent visits to the Natural History Museum to learn more about the collections of moths and butterflies which are kept here. I live in South Oxfordshire, in a tiny village in the Chilterns, which is a beautiful part of the countryside. My house backs onto open fields and a bridle path, and I have the luxury of a wonderful nature reserve, the Warburg Nature Reserve, which is less than a two mile walk from my front door, and is hidden away within rolling hills. Warburg is famous for being rem remote and having beautiful orchids. The Chilterns is an incredible place, 
to watch and find all subjects of nature, such as fallow deer, red kites, foxes, badgers, and an abundance of bumblebees, beetles, dragonflies, moths, and butterflies. These include hummingbird hawk moths, purple emperors, and elephant hawk moths. All of these I've been lucky enough to have seen in my garden. I started photographing insects, moths, and butterflies from the age of seven, and probably always took it for granted that I was never afraid of them and always looked on in wonder at them. I wasn't ever afraid of spiders and was always fascinated by the insects I found in flower beds, rivers, ponds, the countryside, or at nature reserves. Bumblebees became my first favorite photographic subject. And here are a few that I found and photographed. I love the mystery of trying to find out species and names of all the insects, and I hope I've identified them correctly. <laughs> I never knew that there were so many, and I've always loved how diverse the natural world is. The photo on the right is of an early bumblebee that hitched the lift in the car on the school run, and I managed to snap a quick photo on my phone. I use the iNaturalist app on my phone to help identify species, and it's a really useful tool for, you, for learning. My love of moths and butterflies really started when in 2021, I spotted a large moth on the brick wall of a building in my school. It was enormous and with its wings open, I could spot a blue tinge of colour to the middle section. Sadly, I think there was slight wing, wing damage, which I spotted in the photograph I took. We couldn't work out what species it was. It was alive and the specific moth measured about eight centimetres. I then started to research what the moth was. It wasn't that easy as I didn't know much about moths back then. But with the help of a local moth conservation group and an amateur lepidopterist, I managed to identify it as a Clifton non prale, otherwise known as a blue underwing. The exciting news about the discovery was that the moth had disappeared from the British Isles in the 1960s and had only just begun to recolonize in England after 50 years. My discovery was particularly unusual as the moth is usually seen at the southern coast of the UK and not in South Oxfordshire. The next photo is of an example of the spectacular moth from the specimens held within the Natural History Museum. The Centre of UK Biodiversity has been particularly helpful in supporting me with viewing moths, and this one in particular. As you can see, it's really beautiful. And this started my fascination in Lepidoptera. I began pho photographing moths and butterflies on my walks in the local countryside, and also on my holidays in Cornwall, Norfolk and Exmoor. Norfolk is an incredible place to view, to view moths and butterflies along the coastal paths and marshes. I was also able to visit the Schoolthorpe Nature Reserve to view their dragonfly hide. There were an abundance of butterflies on this particular day, and the Red Admiral in the far left photo landed on my T-shirt. I have recently returned from a holiday in Dartmoor, where I was able to visit a butterfly farm, where I was able to view and sit among many exotic butterflies, such as the Blue Morpho, an owl butterfly, and the Red Postman. Butterflies were not in enclosures, so were fluttering around all the plants. It must be amazing to see these butterflies in their natural habitat. Since last year, I've been visiting the Natural History Museum each month to learn more about entomology and what it entails as a career, and also to look at more of the Lepidoptera specimens held here. I've been making use of the Centre of UK Biodiversity, and I've started to use my love of art and history to draw specimens and research more about the entomologists and naturalists behind the discoveries. Here are a few microscope photographs of my favourite moths and butterflies I have viewed in the museum. I find micromoths particularly fast. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm particularly amazed by the micromoths that are not so little in some cases, and how beautiful and iridescent these moths appear under a microscope. Nature is amazing, and I'm always surprised by the beauty of the tiniest of insects. And here are some photos that I've taken whilst visiting the museum. I find micromoths particularly fascinating because not much is known about them or their origins, yet, some micromoths have been found preserved in amber from millions of years ago. I'm a member of the British Naturalist Association as a young naturalist, and I am participating in their bee and butterfly recording for April to October. Due to the recent heavy rain, there are not many sightings currently of bees. I've also just written an article about my interest in moths for the next Young Naturalist newsletter. And I'm also a member of the Amateur Entomologist Society. I've learned to reference moths and read about them, and I enjoy writing facts and drawing illustrations of them. I think it's incredible that the reference books relate to the actual pin numbers within the museum's vaults. And at the bottom here is my artistic interpretation of a pinned Death Heads Walk moth from the Natural History Museum. I read endless books and magazines on moths and their origins, and my project for the summer is to hang a moth trap in the garden, and I will hopefully find some interesting species. I have also just registered to join a moth identification skills session in another local nature reserve close to me in May. 
the Xbox will ha hang a moth trap in the night the night before the session for us to view. To end my presentation, here are a few facts that I've learned about Lepidoptera recently, some of which have been shared with me by Dr. Lees and Dr. Fenring, who I've had the pleasure of meeting here at the museum on recent visits, so I'll let you read that. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed my talk today. Thank you so much, Eve. Thank you so much. Um, I can leave these on for another second if people still want to read through. Um, and the next speaker we have is Hao Yong. Um, if it's OK to refrain from taking videos and photographs of Hao Yong and their presentation. Um, good. Going backwards. Hello, nice to meet you all. Um, actually, I'm actually really nervous because this is a step down from all the academic stuff we've heard from earlier. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, hi, my name's Evelyn David. I'm a lot of things. I'm 18, I'm a sixth former, I'm a biologist, I'm an artist, but most importantly, today I'm an entomologist. Um, here are some of the things I've done and I hope you enjoy my talk. So before we start, I want you to have this question in mind. Oops, the phone's turned off. Um, what have insects done for us? Specifically more, what, specifically more so, what have insects done for the people living past, the, the people born in the 2000s, 2000s to 2010, 2020s, 2020 to 2024? Like the people, to put this plainly, the people my age and below. <laughs> so, um, so just keep that in mind for the entirety of my talk. Um, by the way, it's, it's all pictures, so there's, there's not gonna be like many words on, on this. Um, so let's play a small game. Um, I'm of oh, what am I? I'm small. I can roll things into a ball, and I like running around. What am I? Just shout it out. Obvious. I'm oh, sorry. Obviously, obviously, I'm the the hit. I'm obviously I'm the the prince from the hit game Katamari Damacy from, that released in 2004. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Dang Miguel. Um, the reason you're probably why 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 am I talking about a video game character in in uh, in, in an entomology lecture? Um, the reason is Katamari Damacy has physics that emulates how like emulate um how dung beetles um 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 how dung beetles um. Roll, exactly, yes, how they collect things into a ball, as you can see here. And with the PS2 graphics, I don't know if you can see like the, you probably won't be able to see, but they have like, a, they also have an array of insects. So since they bear resemblance to, um, um, to since these games take take inspiration from directly directly from insects, it helps people who hasn't, who, who isn't into entomology see more of the world, such as me. Um, my journey actually starts in the pandemic, so you probably, so you can probably guess I was stuck inside um, when this career is all about going outside, looking at nature. I mean, it doesn't change much. I, I'm still like sitting in the collections, not going out and doing much, but you know, we move on. But it's through games like those that help people. Um, the game that actually started me into entomology was Hollow Knight. It's a Metroidvania for the people who are you don't know games that much a metroidvania is like a bullet hell game um and it heavily takes references from from um from uh from insects uh sorry i'm just picking up my notes please uh yes so i'm gonna put some of the characters up here and if you just want to shout out what insects they might be um so does anyone have a guess Dung beetle, yes, yeah, true. What about this one? Giraffe yes, good job, good job. That's one of my favorites. What about this one? Mantis. Yes. Okay, no one's gonna get this. But it's supposed to be an aphid, but I don't know how they did that. Um, termite, yes, termite queens. Yes. And this one. Spiders. Spiders, yeah, kind of looks like or um or weavers, but yeah. Um, I also really love how the game emulates insect behavior as well. As you can see, this is an example of mimicry. Um, this is 
one of the scariest one of the one of the bosses that actually scared me the most and i didn't expect it so um there we go um the game um is based Hollow Knight is all about corruption, failure, and the absolute, which is typically what, which is typically how games, I mean, which is typically how insects are represented in games. But the way that Hollow Knight differentiates from other games is that it gives them a story. It gives them sentience, and it in the in in the in the journey to learn more about coexistence and more about strife, bug trauma. So um, and because of it, uh, give me one second. <laughs> Um, uh oh. Uh, and it also hinges on the concept of parasitism, which is the relationship between two organisms where one um benefits off the other other's detriment. And to full blown possession, and you're constantly reminded of this throughout the whole game by individuals called the infected, and um. Sorry, that was a bit of spoilers, but by uh, by the infection, well, typically. This also mimics real world um, phenomenons, as you can see in parasitic fungi and um, and parasites. So an example of that is cordyceps. Thank you, Eleanor, for I don't need to explain what cordyceps are anymore. I'm so glad about that. That cuts my time yeah. now. So here you go. You've got cordyceps and you've got, you got your um, ophiocordyceps as well. So you've got all of that. Um, here is the thing that Eleanor explained earlier as well. Um, so yeah, it shows because of games like these, it 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 um ex it inspires. It hopefully inspires. Hopefully inspires um individuals to seek out more of the of the inspirations that the games take. Um, but there are other other games and other pieces of media that to take things directly from entomology and insects and directly applies them. And that game is Pokemon. Um, so Satoshi Tajiri and Junusi Masuda were big bug fans. Masuda spent most of his time as a child spent um, um, in nature going around collecting bugs. But for Satoshi Tajiri, it had an even bigger influence. He was the token um, bug fanatic. He even had a nickname from his um, peers called Mr. Bug. Um, he was also he also wanted to become an entomologist, but alas, the video game industry took him away from us. Even though, um, which is so sad because we don't have that many entomologists, we need to assume world domination. Um, uh, whoops. Um, <laughs> oh, slide. Um, so yes, we also that it, especially in um Pokemon, you have these like direct influences with the with the real world counter counterparts as well. So um the game creators they directly implemented things from the from real from real world events such as um in Japan they have this huge subculture revolving around, around entomology bigger than the West has it because um does anyone know what um oh do you know any? Does anyone know what Dragon King is, or not? Dragon, um, Dinosaur King, the the series. Okay, that's okay. That's okay. Um, because uh, it was it was a hit show back in the two thousands where it was just like dinosaurs like running around. Um, but in the in Japan they have one called Mushi King, which is based on beetles and beetle fighting. So he he made all the he made this this game based on entomology, and it's such it it it. In, 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 in me, being uh, a Pokemon, um, sorry, Pokemon having its first so, so. for a powerhouse in the gaming industry, such as Pokemon, to have its roots in entomology is huge. Not many people actually know of these roots. Like everyone knows, everyone here knows what Pokemon is. Like, like even these adult, even the, the even the adults in the room probably know what Pokemon is, but. But they don't know that, like these, no one knows that it was rooted in entomology, and we could use this for educational purposes. We could introduce so many people into entomology because of it. And like as he says, people had people don't remember, people have forgotten what nature is. Like they've forgotten the things that are out there. It's a comfort game because you can take 
you can experience things in a digital world, but we can slowly introduce to, to like children or even teenagers the idea of just going out there and there's so much more. Um, so here are some examples that people have done to like, you know, engage in, in wider audiences. And if you haven't already guessed, I'm one of those people who went down that Pokemon to bug loving um, pipelines, um, but I'm not the only one. These are real life. Um, there are other individuals, people who have named real insects after Pokemon. That that the one in the top left, that's uh, a beetle from the, the uh, three new beetle species, uh, I think, that were all named um, after Pokemon the, from the Cantos reason because they were so rare. You got the bottom one named that's from a bee in Chile named after Charizard. You can't see it, but it has Charizard in the name for it. That one is named after Weedle because it has a spine on its head. Um, and recently, I think a year or two ago, they named after a recent um, Pokemon called Pheromosa. Um, it's cockroach, by the way. So there are so many people, there is so much out there that we could do for young people to make them more interested in entomology. Insects have also provided inspiration for people in fashion and designers for um, over a millennia. We from the people from ancient Egyptian with their scarab amulets to the people who, who mix paints with their um, formulas to the people even nowadays with to like the tattoo artists sitting in their parlor, probably hunched over tattooing a bug on someone's back. It's like there it, it is still present till this day. Um, one specific thing I'd like to one specific um, thing in fashion I'd like to point to is jewelry. One thing we cannot deny is that insects are beautiful that, and that people want to recreate their essence in things that we can ornate ourselves with, to things that we can wear. So, and like ancient civilizations such as the ancient Egyptians trumped this. They, there's the scarab beetles were considered um, sacred and they had carved these into as many stones as they can find. It was into amulets, into rings, into, um, um, necklaces and they, it was even worn into war because it had they, it was believed to have protective qualities. Um, this is in the ninth. This is the the Mexican Makesh, which is um, uh, ooh, sorry. In the nineteen eighties, this took off. It's the this beetle is the from the Zephyridae family. I don't. I hopefully I pronounced that right. Zephyridae um, family and um, with the beetle itself, it's. Um, um, it's only from South America, and it has it 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 has it does play a huge role in their ecosystems as well. Having their larvae, um, it, it aids in biodegradation where its larvae um eats the the bark of dead trees, and it's th these people attach chains and they attach rhinestones to it, and it's a living brooch. Like they try to make brooches out of it. It is highly unethical. Please do not recreate this. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's it was popularized by um, a Mayan folklore where a princess and this common man fell in love and and their love was forbidden. And because of that, the king found out and um, he was really unhappy. So he, he, he initially tried to sentence the man to death, but the princess pleaded and instead the king turned the man into a beetle as, so that she could wear over her heart. So it is commonly and traditionally given as uh, a memento from um, a man to his um, his lover as a symbol of undying love. Um, there was also a, a Western um, replication in 2006 by fashion designer Jared Gold, who implemented instead of uh, uh, the 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 Yucatan the I can't even pronounce it the the the, the, severe, uh, the be, this beetle they put a Madagascan Madagascan hissing cockroach instead. <laughs> I put this image up specifically because this is the I haven't heard like um it's like one of the most recent things that happens in the 2000 with the Suez Canal. Suez Canal. I hopefully saw that right as well. Um, but when the Suez Canal was opened up, it led to the British having having interest with what the Egyptians had, and this led to the Victorian era of fashion where 
where um, they had used insect motifs to decorate themselves from with with um, from pearls to diamonds. They like. Some of these are so expensive. I was trying, I was looking these up and they were like 1.4 million. I, I don't understand like the, the 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 price behind them, but like they they were heavily, they were heavily that there, there is no end to these. Um they did not they also didn't restrict themselves to pearls and jewels. They also experimented with um real insects. Um but mostly um, like dead wing casings and um, wings, as you can see there. There, I want the, um, that 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 second image on the top left came as a package. The the, the bird earrings are apparently live taxidermied hummingbirds, and I know it, it, it's just quite strange with their obsession with um, taxidermy at that time. That led to a Victor um, a, a boom in insect jewelry, and it really displays the the. Victorian obsession with taxidermy. Um, I mentioned these because I believe that there's a revival in the in the fashion of insects. As you can see here, there are many um, there are many different things. These are all of like Etsy list things. Um, people who have really who have actually created the, these. Like no species, no no insect is left is left untouched. There are so many things here. There are more, especially there are there are way more. Um, the most interesting thing here is this beetle. It is um, there's a special word for it. I'm trying to remember it. It's called. It has been electroformed, which means it has been where it's a real stag beetle that has been plated with um a metal, and that's why it's like and it's just it still has everything underneath. That's like when you cut into a cake, but I don't think you would want to eat that cake. Anyways, um, <laughs> yeah, so. Insects have been used for so many um, different types of craft and different types of um, jewelry that we use that, that we still use today. Like where there's fashion, there is um, fashion trends. Oops, that's the next slide. Sorry. Um, in even in today, modern, even more fashion designers are using insects for um, as inspiration. This is from an art student from UAL. Her name has been cut off, unfortunately, but her name is um, Adelaida, uh, and she and her designs have particularly took it, taken an interest to me. Um, so yeah, here's some more examples. And yeah, where there's uh, fashion, there's um, fashion trends. With in our generation, we saw the rise of um, the cottage core trend, where we, which definitely contributed to more zoological and botanical, um, um, like fits, I guess, more jewelry, more clothes, and because of that, insects have also contributed to the aesthetic in a big way, where pe because of the whole where because of the whole um, focus on nature, we've seen more bags, more jewelry, more earrings, more um, dresses. It's just a huge boom, which ref reflects the reflects how the how how the Victorians also did it. I mean, taking a look at the previous the previous slides about jewelry, I feel like there's also an increase with taxidermy as an art form. Um, Okay. Onto the last section of my talk, I'm going to be talking about the weirdest, the most iconic, and the most. You'll see what I mean. It's the weirdest contribution of insects into pop culture, and the most memeable as well. The Bee Movie. <laughs> the, bee, the Bee Movie was released in 2007 and it was well received, I guess. Um, to give a short synopsis, um, Barry B. Benson, our protagonist, he sues humans for their exploita exploitation of bees. And um, it's a good movie in the sense that it helps kids understand of the relationship between flowers and um, flowers and bees, but also how they impact us as humans. Um, but I need to emphasize on the word short synopsis, because if you have watched the movie, you will understand the inaccuracies and the absurdities that go on. Um, 
So that's where my praises end. Insects are rep represented inaccurately, which is a really sad fact, especially in media, which is which is also really dangerous when you're expressing them to children. But I guess they must take creative liberties somewhere. Um, and that was when they made Barry B. Benson, a male honeybee, a worker bee. <laughs> If you know anything about um, about bee anatomy, you'd understand that honeybees are a eusocial social species, meaning they have cooperative brood care, overlapping generations, and uh, what is that? Uh, a col uh, and division of labor, which can lead to cases. And that usually tip cons consists of the worker bee, the drones, and the queens. But the drones' only function is for reproduction. When, this, when a drone um, reproduces with the queen, his endophallus, his appendage, is, is um, falls off and he dies. A successful male bee is a dead male bee. <laughs> and um, Barry also has a stinger, as you saw from that slide, from the second slide, um, which is usually only reserved for female honeybees because it's a modified egg laying device called an ovipositor. For what reasons whatsoever that they chose that for a male honeybee, I don't understand. They could have done, they could have made it a character, a, a female centric cat story, but no, they had to go the male route. <clears throat> the movie is so so, oh, sorry, wrong place. Uh, the movie is also highly inaccurate because um, it states that the, in the movie that it states that they can only have one job for life, but that's also wrong. Honeybees, I mean, in general, they the the way that they um, get their jobs is by the way um, the days progress, and as you can see here, as the days progress, they become they they go, they move up in ranks. The, uh, the movie is so mind-numbingly inaccurate and so male-centric that you hardly ever even see female bees. They're only ever there to swoon over the male bees. Um, but in real colonies, they're 95% saturated with female worker bees. And if drones, if there are too many drones, it can indicate poor colony health. The B movie made a matri matriarchal society into a patriarchal nightmare. But what the worst of it? The beginning. We all know of this fate of these famous first words. But it is a myth that has been reiterated way too many times. Um, it, it originated from the original statement about a bee not being able to fly actually refers to bumblebees, not honeybees as the um, as the movie insinuates. Um, it comes from a mathematical misunderstanding of flight in insects. No one at that time knew how bumblebees um, created lift and they started to compare the wings of bumblebees, which are which can flex and bend and and are just delicate little things to that of birds and planes, which are stiff and made out of solid material. I mean, they're, they're both solid material, but like things that are very stiff. And they applied um, 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 aerodynamic calculations, which are inappropriate in that, in, in that scenario. Um, flight is an awfully long uh, concept to talk about, but this is such a good book that I recommend. It, it not only talks about um, 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 flights in insects, but flights in other animals and dinosaurs as well. However, I do recommend if it's like um, if if individuals over fourteen read it because they do have a little bit of swearing. Like I think there's like one or two swear words. Um, anyways, it is a great read. Um, regardless. <laughs> but why bother with discrepancies? He gets a human girlfriend. None of this movie makes sense. <laughs> The B movie is the is one of the weirdest, cult, most culturally significant pieces of media in pop culture, <laughs> leading to an array of themes that seem to always come back every three years. We watched this movie growing up, 
And despite that, it is still thriving in online communities, despite having nothing to do with an actual biological representation of bees. We are still enamored by whatever this is. <laughs> Again, total world domination. We could have had that ages ago with the B movie. We could have had it, um, individuals making memes or being obsessed about actual real world bees. But no, because of this movie, it has set us back by 20 or 40 years. <laughs> 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 So where does that leave us now? Oops. Insects are important in every generation. It gives the creative mind something to dwell on, something to work on, something to show. It leads to more art in all sorts of mediums, movies, games, memes, fashion, everything you can think of. Everything is possible can be possibly inspired by insects. It keeps it all because I mentioned this because we need to keep insects in our focus by having games, by having movies. It shows individuals that they exist. There is a thing called um, there's a phenomenon ph phenomenon called plant blindness, pl plant blindness, where people don't like people don't remember that they've seen a plant on the way to school or whatever. That's a real phenomenon. We need to keep. We don't want that happening with insects either. They exist. Um, we need to keep them in our focus to inspire the next generation, whether scientific, just for scientific purposes, or just for their beauty. From this talk, please take away one thing. Keep being inspired by the natural world. Entomology for, for me was fun to learn about. It's fun to do, but I, it was very difficult to get into at first. I didn't get any, I, it was fun to read all these books, fun to watch movies, but I didn't get any experience into it until I was in year 12. And if, and I'm gonna share some experiences with you that are easily accessible for those that are younger so you can, get yourself out there because getting experience is is great we, we it, it is fun and you just put your name out there one thing i'd like to talk about is cody dog this is an all-star lane in canning town debatable but they have it is a really good site that, for volunteering um they, they they did hold a bumblebee workshop they've held um a butterfly workshop they 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 do lots of activities as you can see there are like that's me and one of my friends on a volunteering thing like our school had forced us to go but like i was really happy to do so it's a really it's a really beautiful site that run that where the where the river lee flows upon as well because they built their site over a dock and um yeah these are things that you can do if you want to take a picture just in case uh and this is one of the last things i'll talk about is the earthwise cute um Q's Earthwise program. There, this last year, I was racking up experience for my personal statement to apply to university. This has been one of the most memorable, most um, gratifying experiences in nature that I've ever experienced. Out of all the experiences I did last year, this one is the one that has stuck with me the most. I still have, I have people in this crowd, I, I have friends in this crowd that I've made in that in this time here, people who are so obsessed with nature, so into it and passionate, that are still here today. And I'm telling you, it is such a good experience. Um, you have, you, you get to go into Creed Gardens for free for five days straight. It's so awesome. They also take you to their Wakehurst site. Um, additionally, um, you get to tr um, experiment with different sampling techniques over the five days and you um, present, as you can see in this over here, we had a little presentation of our findings and you have to just create something to present. And yeah, this we also had a, um, a little session on cordyceps. You get to go into their, their, um, their um, collections. You get to go into their plant nurseries, whatever they have. You can just go in there. And um, yeah, I, it was so good. I, I decided to make a second slide about it. It's there's just so much about the experience that I enjoyed. So um, yeah. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
Uh, does anyone have any questions? I don't know if I'll be able to answer them, but still, I, I can take them definitely. Yes, Jakob. Favorite part of the Ooh. Um, going to the Waco site was one of my ooh, going to the Waco site was one of my favorite events because they took you down into the seed bank and you were able to see what they were doing. You got to talk with the people that were there, and it was just a good experience overall. Um, my favorite, my favorite second experience was the ice cream that they had in all of their sites because they have such delicious ice cream. I'm plus for for us for, for for part of the for part of the um program. But I think the program is for people who are between 14 to 17, so that's the only restriction. I think you'll have to look it up. I don't count me on that. Anyone else? Yes. Do you know the website or link? Oh, it's just on their website. Just type in Q Earthwise and they'll have it up there. Anyone else? Um, thank you, Evelyn. So it's it's 3 p.m. now um, about the time we're planning to start the workshops, but we do have one more plant speaker. Is Zach here? No, I haven't seen Zach today, so we might have to postpone that one and um, start off with the workshops. So what we have planned is we have uh, Young Wilders, which is a team of three, Jack, D, and Layla, who are just at the back there waving. So come find them. <laughs> Um, they're going to be in the Angela Marmon Center with Jane and Isaac Plowright doing creative workshops. Um, those creative workshops are friendly to any ages from really, really small ones to a little bit older. There's plenty of things to do. Um, so if you've also signed up for a behind the scenes tour with Biula, Biula's right here. <laughs> um, and yeah, feel free to have a tea, a coffee and slowly make your way over if anyone needs help finding the Angela Marmon Center, just let us know and we'll take you there. Um, and I hope you enjoyed today's talks and stay for the afternoon workshops and for all the speakers, a round of applause. <laughs>